You're listening to TIP. On today's show, I talk with real estate expert Gabriel Hamill. Gabriel is the founder and CEO of Hamill Investments, where he has amassed a multi million dollar real estate portfolio consisting of single family homes, multifamily apartments, and commercial real estate, primarily using creative financing strategies. He's passionate about helping millennials achieve their goals through self education and financial literacy. You're listening to Millennial Investing by the Investors Podcast Network, where your host, Robert Leonard, interviews successful entrepreneurs, business leaders, and investors to help educate and inspire the millennial generation. Hey, everyone. As always, I'm your host, Robert Leonard, and with me today, I have Gabriel Hamill. We're going to start today's conversation by talking about seller financing. I think how he was able to acquire a lot of properties through seller financing with very little to no money down is going to be super valuable for you guys to learn about. So let's start there, Gabriel. What exactly is seller financing? Yeah, seller financing is basically rather than going to get in a bank loan, you have the seller carry the financing for you. And so you create terms that are beneficial for both the buyer and the seller. So when you go to a bank, the bank's going to tell you, hey, here's what I need for a down payment. Here's your interest rate. These are the terms of the loan. And you either are approved or you're not. With seller financing, there's a lot more options to be creative uh, as far as the down payment, the interest rate, the term of the loan. Uh, You could do interest only payment, every dollar of the payment going directly towards principal. So it's really as creative as you and the seller can get. And it really creates this true win-win scenario for both them and yourself. What must the situation be for somebody on the seller side for that to work out? Yeah. On the seller side, the property doesn't, does not have to be free and clear, but a good portion of the seller financing deals I've done, the seller has owned the property for a significant amount of time and usually has paid it off. And so in most cases, these are really good people that are just tired of being landlords. And so They haven't ever hired property management. They either have another full-time job or business and they're just burnt out. And they're they're in a position where they still want that passive income coming every month, but they don't want to be landlord. They don't want to have to deal with tenants and toilets and all that stuff. And so it creates a scenario where you can come in and start making your mortgage payments directly to them. So they still get that level of passivity with their income and you're taking away a headache essentially for them. And then you get the upside of that. If maybe the rents are low or properties poorly managed or there's some deferred maintenance, you have an opportunity to to really increase the value of the property. For someone listening to the show who might not be super familiar with real estate, this might seem super abstract or maybe risky for the seller. How does the seller mitigate their risk and how do they know that you're a good credit risk? Yeah, a lot of it's going to just be relationship based, you know, face to face with a seller. Now, I've done some seller financing deals where there are agents involved, but a lot of the seller financing deals I've found have been through just networking and letting people know what I'm looking for. Even Craigslist, people laugh all the time when they say, hey, where do you find your best seller financing deals? And I say, hey, Craigslist. A lot of times these are sellers that don't want to hire an agent. So really just sitting down and being authentic with the seller. And it's really about asking good questions. It's you know asking questions and then shutting up and letting them speak. Most sellers are willing to tell you a lot about the property if you ask the right questions. At the end of the day, it's a relationship business. What are the legalities around this? Is there a contract in place? What does that look like? Yeah, you can do a formal contract. Usually if there's an agent involved, I will do a purchase agreement just like I would if, if I was going to make an offer on a, on a listed property or if you were going to go get bank financing. But a lot of times I'll negotiate a deal pretty informally with the seller, especially if it's a face-to-face interaction. So it might be discussing it and then sending those terms off to an agreement off to escrow or title company. And it might be email back and forth until we come to terms and agree, uh, agree on something that we can send off. But I try to keep it pretty informally until we have something pinned down that we're both happy with. And then once you agree on terms, is there an official note like you would have with the bank? And do they have the collateral as backing that note still? Yep, exactly. So just like a bank loan, you would do a note and trust deed with the terms that that you've agreed upon. If the property is not free and clear, there's other ways to do that. You can wrap the mortgage land sale contract subject to, but in most cases, 
I'll buy properties that are free and clear and so that I can take title when I close on the property. How can you go about this if somebody hasn't fully paid off their mortgage yet? Well, there's a few ways to do it. You can take title that you run the risk of the banks have what's called the due on sales clause. So the risk to the seller, if you were to do that, is the bank potentially could say, now it's really rare because banks aren't out there looking for it. And it's not illegal, but the bank does have a right to say, hey, this changed title, I want paid in full and give them like however many days, 60 days to pay it in full. And so to avoid that risk for the seller and then for you as the buyer, if the bank takes property back, you're without a property. Their contract is going to be a lot stronger than your contract with the seller. And so to avoid that, typically what I would do is a land sale contract. So it's set up very similarly. You're just not taking title. You're essentially making your payments to the seller and the seller is still obligated to make their payments to their bank or their financial institution until, until they've completed the, the terms of their loan. Yeah, that due on sale clause is exactly what was running through the back of my mind as you were talking. It sounds like that could be a little bit more of an issue if they still have a loan on it. So how can you go about finding people that have owned the property and don't have a mortgage anymore? Are there any resources or tools that people can use to find those specific type of properties? Honestly, almost with any property I look at, it's the first question I ask. Because there's so much flexibility with seller financing, I typically will ask the question, hey, are you in a position to carry financing? Or I would ask, do you owe anything on the house? Just basic questions like that to see if the seller, first of all, has it free and clear, but also if they know what seller financing is. One thing I get asked a lot is, how do you talk a seller into carrying financing? How do you talk or convince a seller to carry the note, to carry the terms, to carry the financing? But I've never had to talk or convince any seller to do that. I've only bought properties with seller financing from sellers that already understood the advantage to them for carrying the financing. At one point, I thought that I would need to educate the world and all these sellers on why they should carry financing for me or for anybody else. And I realized that every deal I'd done were sellers that had already understood the advantage. So rather than spend my time trying to educate folks, why don't I just get in front of more people who are in a position to carry the financing? And a lot of times that is just asking the question to them directly or having your agent or broker ask their agent, hey, are they in a position to carry financing? Would they consider seller financing? A lot of times the answer is no. And if it's a seller that understands the advantage, a lot of times the answer is yes. And then it just comes down to whether the terms will work for both you and them. What are some of those advantages for them as a seller? Yeah, for a seller, they still get that level of passivity from the monthly income. And so a lot of the sellers that are interested in carrying the financing are men and women in their 60s and 70s that they don't want to lump sum of cash. For one, they would have to pay that capital gain up front at once if they got that lump sum. And the other problem is then they have to go take that money and go put it back into an investment of some sort to pay them for the rest of their life. And so with this, they're not paying that huge capital gain up front from selling the property and getting the cash sale or going and getting the bank loan and them getting this lump sum cash. They get that payment for every month for the rest of their life or until the term length is over. The other advantage is, and you had mentioned it before, that it's collateralized by the property. So it's backed by an asset that they're already comfortable with and have owned for a long time. So if you were to default, which I've never done, if someone were to default, the, essentially the sellers could just get the property back. And in most cases, the buyer had improved the property. And so that's, those are a couple of the advantages to them. A great point you made is about the seller knowing their property the property that you're buying, they know that property very well. Whereas with a bank, they don't know anything about the property. I mean, they get an appraisal, so they know what it might be worth. But when they're foreclosing on it, they don't know much about that property really. Whereas the seller, they've probably owned the property for decades. They know it inside and out. So there's much less risk for them because if they do have to take that asset back over, at least they know the asset they're getting back. Now, I know this was a strategy that you implemented early on in your career, but would you recommend it to new investors today? Absolutely, 100%. It just comes down to finding sellers that are in a position to do that. And so for me, it was really out of necessity that I started buying properties with seller financing. And we could talk about that a little bit. You know, a deal that I'm closing on right now is also a seller financing deal. And so I've done it from the beginning and I'll continue to do it. And a lot of it is just I enjoy that flexibility of financing that you just don't get at a bank. That's really interesting because obviously, since you've started, you've had a lot of success since then, but you continue to do it. 
Is there any like jargon or just anything specific that somebody needs to know if they want to get started in, in seller financing? Because when you think about going to a bank, that's pretty standard. It's more or less the same everywhere you go. But with seller financing, it sounds like there's a lot of variables. And if you don't understand the basics already, then it could be confusing. Where should somebody start from that aspect? You know, it really depends. So there's going to be a lot less paperwork and legal jargon in general just by doing a seller financing contract. But if you understand the basic terms of a traditional mortgage and can look at that and just start moving the pieces around as far as, okay, a bank says I need 20% down. What if I structured this with 5% down or, or no money down or 10% down? The bank's telling me 5%. Well, what is it that the seller actually wants? And so it's not so much the legal jargon. It's more just understanding what a typical bank note looks like, which anyone going to get a mortgage should, should have a basic understanding of how that works. And then manipulating and changing those numbers as much as you and the seller are happy to do to make it work for you and them. There's some little things you can do like, you know, on the note as far as to secure, to have some security for both you and the seller. You know, it just really depends how in depth you want to get with the note itself. But it can be pretty basic too, just outlining down payment, interest rate, length of the note, et cetera. I think that the point you made about the down payment is super important and I want to go back to that. But before we do, do you think it makes sense to maybe have an agent or a lawyer even for just a couple thousand bucks, bring them on your team and have them kind of walk through the process with you? Specifically because it's your first deal, maybe have them check things over. Is that a good way to spend a few thousand dollars? As far as the agent side, not necessarily. I mean, most agents don't know or don't understand what seller financing is. And that's both your agent that you bring in and also with a seller's agent. So a lot of times if there's an agent involved, the listing agent will not know if their buyer's in a position. And oftentimes they don't even ask their seller if they're in a position to carry financing because they don't necessarily understand that. The attorney side, Maybe for the contract, yes. But if you have a good, a lot of title and escrow companies will have an in-house attorney that when you give them the terms of the loan, they can write a note and trust deed that would be very similar to if you were to get bank financing. So maybe yes on the attorney side, not so much on the agent side, unless you find an agent that really understands or is willing to learn the advantages of seller financing. Yeah, you'd likely have to find a real estate agent that's an investor themselves that maybe would understand it from that perspective. Otherwise, like you said, a general agent probably isn't going to know. Which now, oddly enough, most agents are not investors and they're around properties all the time and even investment properties. And I don't remember the statistic, but it's a very small percentage of agents actually invest in real estate. Going back to that down payment percentage, I think that's such a key point. And I want to dive into that because I think one of the biggest hurdles for a lot of people to get started in real estate is that down payment, right? When you yep. go to a bank, you need 20%. And a lot of times that's a significant chunk of money. So if you can get 5% or even no money down, if you can structure the deal right, I think that's amazing. So talk to us a little bit about how that works with seller financing. Why might a seller not want any money down? Yeah. So usually sellers are stuck on either down payment, interest rate, or price. And it's rarely all three. And so for me, again, it was out of necessity that I just didn't have a down payment or multiple down payments as I started buying properties. So for me, it was out of that necessity of, okay, if I can't give sellers a down payment, what if I could give them the price they want or an interest they want or something that would work for both of us, but not give them the down payment? So a lot of times the sellers are more interested in that monthly payment or the purchase price or the interest than they are the down payment. And so if you can structure a deal where it still works for you and not bring in a bunch of money to the table and they're happy with that, it still creates that win-win scenario. Now, some sellers are stuck on a huge down payment. And when I was starting out with seller financing deals, I just wasn't in a position to do those deals. And so I found properties that the seller didn't require very much, or in some cases, none. And in some cases, even walking away with cash at closing on some of these deals, it's just, again, getting in front of enough sellers. How can you walk away from a deal with cash yeah. So first of all, if you do a no money down deal, your, your risk is limited because you have no money in, you know, on the table of your own. But the other thing you could do to close and put money in your pocket is you collect the deposits, last month's rent. And if you strategically close 
early on in the month, you get the prorated rent too. So a lot of times I would close, let's say December 8th, right? And so then I would collect almost all of December's rent at closing. I would collect the down or the deposits at closing and I would collect the last month's rent at closing. You know, on a multifamily property, even a small multifamily property, that could add up to several thousand dollars that you walk away with at closing. And then you're not collecting rent again until that, that following month. And you can even, going back to the creativeness of seller financing, you can structure deals where your payment starts two, three, six months after you close on the deal, if you can get the seller to agree to that. There really is just so much you can do with seller financing. I mean, there's no rules, really. Like, there's no norm. You know, with a bank, you have your typical terms, they have their typical structure that you have to follow. But with seller financing, it's really whatever you can come to an agreement on with the seller. You know, for the down payment, and, and for one of the reasons why it's such a good strategy for new investors is that the down payment is, can be less. You know, if you don't have a big down payment, maybe you offer to pay a little bit more for the property. So if they're asking, say, maybe 200 with, say, 20% down, maybe you do 225 or 230, but you only have to put three or five, maybe 10% down. That way you can get into the deal. I mean, as long as the numbers make sense, I can see that as a good way to get into a deal. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. You know, and you just look at each individual, each individual property individually, you know, what might work for one property or for one seller or what might work for you on one particular property may not work on a different one. So just, you don't have to go into every property with the idea that's going to be the exact same terms. It's really about listening to what the seller's problem is, why they're selling, what can you solve their problem? If you can solve the seller's problem and create us that scenario for them, I've had sell like I'm stoked that I just bought this property and the sellers are thanking me for buying the property because they're happy with the terms. And I'm going, they're they're thanking me. They're happy. I'm I'm the one walking away smiling. So it's it really is that win-win. That really is such a great deal for both parties. Now, two of the most common excuses I hear from people for not starting to invest in real estate is that they don't have enough money for a down payment and that their market is too expensive. You've already shown that it is definitely possible to do this without your own capital. So now walk us through how you've also done this in an expensive market. Sure. So you can be successful in real estate in in any market, I believe. It just comes down to knowing knowing the market. I don't live in an inexpensive market. I live in a college town. I'm on the West Coast. It's less expensive than some West Coast towns, but you know, medium home price is in the mid 300s and you're talking, you know, significantly more on multifamily. But Going back to what I said before about finding properties that are poorly managed, under-rented, and have deferred maintenance, you can find properties that have that upside. You create that scenario that will work. And so for me, I always focused on cash flow first. I would buy in areas of town that I believed would have growth, but I I made sure that the numbers fit and the property cash flowed from the get-go. That was really kind of out of necessity how I had to build my portfolio. If the property wasn't cash flow positive, from the day I bought it, it wasn't going to work for me. So speculation or appreciation, I looked at as a bonus and second to cash flow. With the market cycle being where it is, are you having a hard time finding deals now to do seller financing? It seems like you know you could put a property on the MLS and sell it in a, in a few days, if not a few hours. So are you having a hard time finding seller financing deals today? I'm not. And I'll, I'll tell you why. I'm I really believe in, and people will tell you, you can't do seller financing anymore. Seller financing is dead. I closed on a commercial property with seven separate residences last year. I'm closing on a 30 unit mobile home park with seller financing, but it really comes down to relationships. My best deals have come down to just genuine relationships. So the deal that I'm closing on now, it was a guy that I met 10 years ago. I reached out to him because he was a developer and I just really admired the work he was doing and the buildings that he was building in town. And so I had a genuine interest in what he was doing. I wasn't trying to buy anything from him. I wasn't trying to sell him anything, but we'd kept in touch throughout the years. And he had messaged me and said, Hey, a friend of mine selling a, a single family home in the town over. Are you interested? And I said, no, I'm not. I'm not looking at single family. I'm looking at value add multifamily or mobile home park. And he said, ah, oh, I have a mobile home park. I actually have a few mobile home parks. There's one that I, I'd be willing to sell you right now. And I said, well, would you be interested in carrying the financing on? And he said, yeah, I would. 
And so it just goes back to the relationships and also letting people know what you're looking for. Had I not reached out to him almost a decade before, and if I had not told him specifically what I was looking for, I probably wouldn't have known about this property and I definitely wouldn't be buying it with seller financing. So you're not likely to find seller financing deals on the MLS, right? You can. The one I bought last year was on the MLS. It was listed with an agent and it had gone through a couple different agents. They were packaging it as a development project. I brought my agent in who is good with people and he went and sat down with the seller and we talked about this. Hey, find out what the seller really needs and let's negotiate a deal that works. And that's, and that's what we did. The seller was really stuck on a couple items, specifically the interest rate. And I was able to work around that and create something where he got the interest he wanted and I was still able to get the property and make it cash flow. Yeah, that's really interesting. So for somebody that's just getting started, who doesn't have contacts from a decade ago, where should they start? How can they start networking with real estate investors? Yeah, they should go and let every single person they know what they're looking for, that they're interested in real estate. My second property ever, after I bought one house, I made business cards. Everybody that I knew that I was a real estate investor and I'm looking for, looking for properties. And that's how I found my second deal. It was a friend at the gym's dad selling a property and I bought it below market in 2006, which was a hot market, bought it significantly below market. But had I not told anyone what I was looking for, I would never have found it. Back then you had to use business cards, but people today, they have something way better. Everybody has a phone in their pocket so they can use social media or bigger pockets or just other resources like that. And they can reach thousands of people so easily, so much easier than you could back in the day with business cards. There was no one in my network that I thought had money or that I knew had money or that owned homes. And so a lot of people think, oh, I don't know anybody selling, but it might not be you know, your grandma or your next door neighbor, but it might be your friend's grandma's cousin. You just, you just never know. And if you tell enough people what you're looking for and you let enough people know, that's how you start building that network. And then the other part of that is building just relationships with the agents and brokers and trying to find the ones that really do understand investment and work with investments and are willing to write crazy offers and, you know, kind of educate themselves on specifically what you're looking for. Yeah. So if you find somebody that's selling who's maybe open to seller financing, but they've never done it before and they're not maybe fully aware of what it is, how do you go about explaining to them the benefits? I've never bought a deal from a seller that didn't already understand the advantage of seller financing. So do you just avoid those? If you come across someone who says they're interested, but they've never done it, do you avoid those transactions? I don't avoid it. I would would definitely consider doing that. I have not been in a position where a seller says, I don't know what that is, but explain it to me and we'll see if it works. I have on the very surface. And then once you get into it, they feel like it's too complicated or it's scary. If you find the sellers that actually understand it, the conversation is less around what it means and more about, all right, how do we structure this? And do you think that's partially because the deals and the properties you're looking at are owned by investors and generally investors kind of know what that is? Yeah, I think that's definitely part of it. And I found too that some of that generation, the men and women in their 60s and 70s, a lot of them bought different properties with seller financing too. So a lot of times that's how they acquired their property. And then just like you said, a lot of times they have multiple units, so they do understand investment to some degree. Another interesting aspect that we haven't even touched on yet is that there's a whole pool of people who can't get traditional financing for whatever reason that may be they could all go this route to get started as well. It's super powerful from that perspective as well. In your experience doing these types of seller finance loans, do they show up on traditional credit reports? No, they they typically do not. That's another interesting aspect. I mean, probably not a ton of huge benefits because your net cash flow is positive. So that would be helping you. But it is an interesting aspect to think about. Yeah. And you mentioned you know people that weren't able to get approved by a bank. And that's the situation I was in. So backing up to my first property, it was 2005 during the subprime. And I went to a bank and they approved me for a no money down deal with bank financing. And so I bought my first house, no money down with bank financing. And then again in 2006, and then in 2007, it was a 5% down deal. And so I'm going, man, I could just buy a house once a year with no money down or use the cash flow and do 5% down. This this is going to be easy. So I did that in 2005, 6, and 7. I still own those properties. 
even though it was fairly traditional financing. But then in 2008, so that was five, six, seven, 2008, I went to the bank and said, all right, I want to buy another house. And they said, well, sorry, things have changed. You actually need income and you actually need a down payment. And we want to see at least like 30% down. And so I'm going, I don't have a down payment. I don't have income to qualify me for another property. And so that is why in 2009, I, I went after the seller financing because I couldn't get approved from a bank. And I, I didn't have the capital to go put 30% down on even one property. What a crazy thing that the bank would require income for a right? loan. <laughs> people, right? Well, people yeah. listening to the show right now who maybe weren't investing back then might be listening and hearing, you did a loan with no income and no money down for a traditional financing. That might, you know, that might blow their mind if they haven't studied that time period at all. And I think it's really interesting two things. One, how you overcame adversity because you hit a roadblock and you could have just said, oh, well, real estate investing just isn't going to work for me. I'll stop at two properties. But you didn't and you continued to charge on. And the second thing is you bought, not necessarily at the peak, but you started to buy pretty late in the cycle. And I'm not a market predictor by any means, but I think we're getting to that point now in today's cycle. So it's really interesting to hear that you were successful then. So that just tells me that people can do it today as well. Yeah, absolutely. And it really comes down to, you know, I've met a lot of people that have made and lost a lot of money in that 2008 time period. And it's most of the people, really everyone that I've ever met that lost money in 2008, they were speculating. They They were basing everything on either what they could sell it or what the projected rents could be after a property is renovated. And so one thing that I did back then that I'm still doing now is I'm really sticking to the principle of cash flow first. The property has to make sense on the day that you buy it. And to your point, I mean, if you're doing seller financing and you put zero down or even 5%, I mean, you have really limited risk. Absolutely. We've talked about structuring deals, but now let's talk about property types. I know you have a diversified portfolio. You have single family, you have varying sizes of multifamily and even some commercial property. Where would you recommend a new real estate investor starts? You know, it's less about where to start and more about just about starting. And so I think a lot of new investors are waiting for that perfect deal and they get in that paralysis of analysis where they never pull the trigger. And so it doesn't necessarily matter where you start. I would say what you're most attracted to, start there. You know, for a lot of people that is single family houses or small multifamily, because a lot of times that's what they, you know, grew up in or they're comfortable with or around, but I've watched people start with commercial. I have a friend that's attracted to self-storage. And so for whatever reason, he is. And so it's, hey, go do that. That might have intimidated me when I started. But whatever you're attracted to, people have been successful in single family and multifamily and commercial and mobile home parks and warehouse space. People have been successful in all. So get, you know, just starting is more important. Yeah, I think that's such a key takeaway. Just take action. I mean, the first property, no matter what it is, it's not going to make you rich. So you just need to get started and then start growing from there. And once the ball starts rolling, it rolls down a hill and it spirals very quickly. And then next thing you know, you have 100 units and and you've reached financial freedom. Yeah. And I love watching people do that. I, I had a friend that just waited for so long. And then we ended up buying a triplex together. I said, hey, if you if you show me one more halfway good deal, we're going to buy this together because you've been just waiting for so long, not pulling the trigger. A couple months later, bought another triplex, him and I. And then a couple months after that, he bought his first fourplex on his own. So he went from no units to 10 units in a really short period of time. But it took that first deal, that first three units for him to feel comfortable and kind of go, okay, that wasn't too bad. That wasn't so painful. I can do this. And now he's off looking at way bigger deals. Yeah, it's really all just about getting started. And for me, I did something very similar. My house hacked my first two deals. And then my third deal, my first rental, I was getting in that analysis paralysis a little bit. And I always told myself, I will never buy a single family. I don't want to start there. I want to start bigger. And so I was in that situation and I couldn't find anything. And then ultimately one day, a good deal on a single family came across my table. And I said, you know what? I'm just going to do it. I just need to take that step. And so I did. And ever since then, my portfolio has grown. And it's really just, just taking that action. Yeah, taking that action, it gives you confidence. Okay, I did this. I can do this. It's not that hard. 
there's so much stigma around real estate, you know, just from the last couple decades. I just, I think there's so much around it that makes people think they can't do it. And then once you do that first deal, you just realize I can do this. And then, you know, it just grows from there. Now, shifting away from real estate a little bit, I know you're a time freedom expert. So I want to dive into that a bit more. You have a quote that I really like, and you said, being rich is having money. Being wealthy is having time. So what is time freedom to you? And why is it so important? Yeah, for me, time freedom is is really owning your time, not being a slave to the clock, doing what you want to do, when you want to do it, how you want to do it. And for me, it kind of kind of came to be because as I was getting into real estate and even before I started buying properties, initially when I was young, it, I had read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which any of your listeners haven't read, they should read. And originally it was, oh, I'm going to get wealthy. I'm going to get rich from real estate. And then as I started exploring my own mind and really asking myself, well, why? Why, why am I drawn to, to this? Why do I want this financial freedom? I realized it was, it was less about, I didn't want to go swim in a, you know, a pool of money. What I really wanted was to own my time. I wanted to do what I wanted to do when I wanted to do it and not have a boss. And so I realized how important time freedom was and how it's rarely talked about. So you hear a lot about financial freedom and that can play a huge part of it is creating enough financial freedom so you own your time. But I also watched a lot of people create businesses and even around real estate where they had the ability of financial freedom, but they never took the time to actually enjoy life. So they had built this massive amount of wealth and they were just doing great on the investment side in their business, but they forgot why they really got into it. And almost anyone I've talked to, when you dig deep enough, they have other reasons to get into it. Rarely is anybody wanting financial freedom just so they can throw a bunch of money around. It's usually about spending time with their family, spending time on their health, traveling, taking care of their parents, something other than the money itself. And so I realized it just wasn't a conversation people were having and that we needed to start talking about time freedom and how valuable it is to own your time. Yeah, I mean, it's one thing to buy a job that can make you wealth, right? And and that's what we talk about with flipping. If you're flipping houses a lot, that can make you very wealthy. But you're essentially buying a job. You're not really buying time freedom there. You're buying a job and you're going to make wealth. Whereas with rental properties, you're more so buying wealth, but you're also buying time freedom. Do you see it the same way? Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's giving yourself more options. So if you have a job that you truly love, you don't have to quit your job, but being in a position where you could if you wanted to. You know, I've met a surgeon recently. He loves what he does, but now he can do it on his own time because he's created enough passive income and enough financial freedom and understands the value of time that he's not doing it because he has to keep up this lifestyle that he has. He's doing it on his own terms when he enjoys it. It's more about not putting yourself in a position where you are where you have to be at a job and you have to clock in to keep that lifestyle that you want. So what tactical advice or, or maybe hacks do you have for someone who really wants to take more control of their life and achieve that time freedom? For me, it's just a constant check-in with myself of, hey, does this align with the things that are most important to me? So for me, it's my family, it's my health, it's building wealth, it's contribution. And so when I take on a new task, I consider doing something. I ask myself, does it align with this? When I turned my properties over to the property management company, there was the question of, do I start my own property management company or I, do I turn this over to a third party property management company? And I realized if I start a property management company, I could create another avenue of wealth. But would that free up more time? No, because I'd be managing employees and I'd be dealing with tenants directly and I would actually be taken away from my time. When I considered syndicating deals, it was the same question. Is that going to add time to my life? Is it going to add another level of passivity? Or is it actually going to create a job for myself? It's constantly having that on the forefront of your mind. What will the net result be if I take on this task or take on these particular tasks in my life? Maybe it will add some financial value. And there's nothing wrong with that. Just realizing what the effect is going to be when you do that. So do you think real estate is the best way to achieve time freedom? I think real estate can be one of the greatest ways to achieve time freedom, yes. 
The other extreme would be if you create enough financial freedom, then yes, you can create this level of time freedom. I mean, the other extreme would be, you know, go live off grid somewhere and plant your own food and live off the land. And sure, there's some time freedom. That would be time freedom too. But I'd rather do it with financial freedom through real estate. What strategies in real estate do you think leads to the most success in achieving time freedom? I think the biggest strategies specific to real estate and time freedom would just having a clear understanding of what's your best usage of time. And so when I first started out and I was managing my own properties and I was doing a lot of the handiwork, which I wasn't that handy, that would take up a lot of my time. And so I knew my time was better spent putting deals together. In fact, I was able to work less in the business and more on the business, so to speak, because I was more efficient with finding deals than I would be if I was at a house, someone's house trying to fix a toilet. And so just knowing what you're good at, knowing how much time something takes, it's easy for a lot of investors, especially if they're very hands-on and, and talented that way to say, oh, I could do this so much less than a contractor. And that's fine, especially starting out. But the problem with that is if all your time is spent on fixing things, you don't leave yourself a lot of time to go put another deal together or go focus on what your best use of time is. Yeah, you really have to think about the opportunity cost. You could probably save a thousand, maybe two thousand dollars by doing, say, flooring yourself, but you spent, say, 20 hours on doing that flooring. Instead of spending the time doing that, you could have spent those hours finding deals. And maybe you found a new deal during that time, and maybe that would make you ten thousand dollars, fifteen thousand dollars, something like that. And clearly, that would be a much more valuable use of your time rather than saving one or two thousand dollars doing the flooring. So you need to really make sure that it's actually the best use of your time. Exactly right. And I think people underestimate the value of having that time and the time to just think. So I think thinking is very valuable time. And I think that, you know, reading and listening to audiobooks and listening to podcasts are very valuable time where some people would say, oh, that's a waste of time. But I often get my best ideas or a solution to a problem when I'm not specifically working in the deal. It's when I'm out on a walk or when I'm you know, out in nature. It's when I'm not working in the business. I usually get to come up with a solution. I personally don't think there's a better ROI than buying a book or listening to a podcast. And that's not because I'm a podcaster, but because podcasts are free and there's a ton of valuable content available in them. And then books, they do cost money, but they're relatively cheap a lot of times you're spending less than $20 per book. And because that base is so small, the ROI is just huge. Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. I know you're also big on mindsets and I love how you think about this. Can you talk to us about your philosophy around mindsets? Yeah, I was fortunate to have a mom who told me at a young age, hey, you can do anything you put your mind to. And I just believed that as a young kid. And so I just took that into every area of my life. and you know, yes, you have to put in the work. So I, it's not just, oh, law of attraction, and I'm just going to think everything into existence. There's definitely that take action part that's important. Almost subconsciously just became a part of my life is, yeah, I can, I can do anything I put my mind to. I've kind of taken the attitude on to every aspect of my life. If you could go back and give one piece of advice to your 25-year-old self, what would you tell yourself? I'd tell myself to build more relationships talk to more people and build genuine relationships. How can somebody get over the mental hurdle maybe of doing that and not seeing a quick ROI, right? Because you're going to build a relationship. And I think a key point to this is it has to be genuine. If you're going to build a genuine relationship, that's going to take time, right? I mean, you're going to have to talk to this person and it's just, it takes time. So you're not going to see your ROI quickly. And I think in today's day and age, probably more than ever, that's so important because you can get anything, almost anything at the snap of your fingers with your mobile phone. So knowing how important relationships are in real estate, and then specifically the strategies we've talked about today, how can somebody get over that mental hurdle of not seeing that ROI right away? I think just understanding yourself enough to know, hey, are you in this for the long term? Is this something you're in? And that, that comes down to spending time just understanding yourself. Are you in this to make a quick buck and get out? Or are you in this to build wealth over a long period of time? And so, you know, going back to just genuine relationships, 
I've met a lot of other investors and people that I've surrounded myself with that some may consider competition. You know, they wouldn't want to talk real estate with them. And I went into it with, you know, hey, maybe I could learn from them. Maybe I could help teach them something. And ultimately, maybe this will be a friendship. Maybe this will be a business opportunity down the road. Maybe it'll just be an acquaintance. Maybe it'll go nowhere. But I would go in this with a long-term vision of, hey, I'm invested in this community. I grew up here. I plan on investing here for a long time. And these relationships are important. If the people that are in it to make a quick buck and to, to just screw someone over, they're not going to last. They're just not. And so just having a clear long-term vision is important. Yeah, I couldn't agree with that more. I think the relationships for the long term is so important and it's having an abundance mindset, right? Because sure, maybe they are a, a competitor in one sense as they're a real estate investor and they're going after the same deals as you. But and I actually recently had a deal where I was going after it and my business partner on that deal and I were talking about it. I told him I was talking to another real estate investor about it and he's like, "Aren't you worried that they're going to steal your deal?" I'm like, "No, not really. And if they do, then so be it." I'd rather build that relationship with that person. I think that's so much more valuable than you know, a couple thousand dollars I might've lost out on that deal. So the relationships and then having an abundance mindset that there's plenty of deals out there for you to get is so much more valuable. You nailed it with the abundance mindset. And I have a great example of, I met a woman years ago and she was actually advertising to sell properties with seller financing. And I would look at multiple properties of hers that she was offering seller financing on. And we never came to terms that would work for me and that she was happy with. And so, but we kept that conversation going and we would talk throughout the years. And then we found ourselves bidding on the same properties. We kept competing with each other. And so after all these years, she said, Hey, I'm, you know, you keep buying these properties. Can I finance you on the next deal you get under contract? And I thought, sure, let's do that. And so she was happy doing that. I was happy because she financed the deal. And it was going back to that. Neither one of us had any alternative motive. You know, we just kept in touch. We both cheered each other on. We both believed in that abundance mindset. And years down the road, it created an opportunity for her and myself. And so you just, you just really never know. You never know where things are going to go. You never know who they may know or who they're going to become. I mean, just building that genuine relationship is just so invaluable. And that's why it's important to do the right thing. You know, you're in this for the long term. That's that reputation is important. Especially if you're just getting started. Don't worry about it. You know, if you're going to lose a deal, if it comes down to doing the right thing or potentially losing a deal, I 100 out of 100 times would always recommend passing on the deal, maintaining your relationships, maintaining your personal brand and just how you're known in the, in the real estate space and just pass on that deal because I think that's so much more important. Yeah, 100%. Gabriel, you've provided a ton of value for the audience and helped break down some of the hurdles that people face when wanting to get into real estate investing. Where can the audience go to connect with you? I'd say I'm most active uh, on Instagram. So Gabriel R. Hamill, or if you search Gabriel Hamill, you'll find me. Uh, you could also find me on Facebook at Gabriel Hamill and my website's hamillinvestments.com. Awesome. I'll be sure to put links to all of Gabriel's resources in the show notes so you guys can go check it out. Before we wrap up today's episode, I wanted to mention some exciting news. I have been working on releasing a new show focused solely on real estate. The new show is called Real Estate Investing by the Investors Podcast Network, and it'll be available in just the next few weeks. On the new podcast, I'll be interviewing successful investors from various real estate investing niches to help educate you on your real estate investing journey, whether you're just getting started or you're looking to grow your business. So if you've enjoyed the episodes about real estate on millennial investing so far, you can check out the new show to learn more about real estate investing. You can find a link to the new show in this episode's show notes below. And lastly, if you've been enjoying the show, I'd really appreciate it if you'd share it with your friends or leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. That's how we're able to grow the show and continue to bring you the best guests and content each week for free. So if you know someone who you think might like the show too, just share it with them and ask them to do the same. I really appreciate all of you guys. I hope this was helpful. I hope your new year is off to a great start and I'll see you back here next week. 
Thank you for listening to TIP. To access our show notes, courses, or forums, go to theinvestorspodcast.com. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any decisions, consult a professional. This show is copyrighted by the Investors Podcast Network. Written permissions must be granted before syndication or rebroadcasting.